Uh, I'm Chris Kevhart. I'm a technical marketing engineer with NetApp, and uh, today we're going to give you a little bit of a, a technical preview, a demonstration of <laughs> VMware Cloud on AWS today, together with our cloud, NetApp Cloud Volume Service. And I'm Glenn Sizemore. I'm a technical marketing architect here with VMware in our storage and availability business unit, and I'm responsible for all things storage in the VMware Cloud and AWS service. Great. So we're going to go through a couple of screenshots first um, in the setup process and then walk through a video recording of this. Um, and the reason we're using a video recording is because this is still an engineering effort. And so there are some things that we weren't able to do um, in the in, in what a customer would kind of see. So we've, we've done some of these things on the back end because VMware is working to develop all the, the, the code that is to enable all of this um, consumption, you know, dynamic consumption and expansion and, you know, all the, the intricacies of the, a managed service, yeah. you know, in this. So you'll see a little bit of, uh, uh, of you know, what, we, what our customers will see when they end up deploying it. So you log into cloud.nf.com and you go and you create an account, sign up or log in. If you're already a NetApp customer, you can use your SSO credentials and be, uh, go right into the portal. Then you have the ability to choose different uh, services that we have within our, our portfolio of, of cloud products. Um, we have uh, file services is, the, is, is where we're going to, what we're going to discuss about today. There are others um, I encourage you to create an account and take a look at. <clears throat> then go to our storage ser services. So cloud volume service, cloud volumes on tap, insight, cloud sync, etc. Click on the get started for cloud volume service. Select the cloud. We're going to select AWS. And then we're going to go and provision out a cloud volumes volume. Um, my comment was going to be around regions, right? Today we support US East 1, US West two, uh, 1, and newly supported US West 2. You create the path. You select your service level, the quota that you want to uh, provide, a tag, a standard uh, uh, AWS tag. You se select your snapshot schedule. We're going to be working with VMware to identify the, the clients that you would be exporting um, the IP addresses to so that you can secure it down to just the IP addresses of the VMC instance. Now you click go and it's going to take about a minute or so to provision out this volume and there's your mount point. All right, so now we're going to pop, pop over to the VMware Cloud and AWS console. And first, I'm going to hop into the SDDC because I want to show you the networking connection that we're actually going to use to connect to the storage. If I go to network and security, this is our NSXT implementation, we can see that I have a Direct Connect connection that's connected into my SDDC. If I go down to that Direct Connect connection, you'll notice that I have learned some BGP routes that connect me into that NFS mount, and I'm advertising the routes up that represent my, e my, my ESX hosts. This is how we're going to be able to talk to that mount. Now, if I go back into the cloud hosted S or vCenter instance, if I go to storage, you can see those two data stores I told you about before, the vSAN one for management and workload. We're going to expand this up on the back end. We've submitted that mount in for information to the personality manager and asked it to go ahead and man ma manage the mount for us. As we can see, we get a data store that com comes in and gets mounted. So what can we do now? Just as logged in as cloud admin with restricted permissions, what can I do with an NFS mount inside the service? Well, of course, I could, I could view it. I could assign tags, which is important for policy-based management. I could go in and create virtual machines using the, the typical deployment methods that we would use, uh, either, either with a content library or, or templates. There are no restrictions. Uh, but more importantly, when it comes to the storage aspect of it, I can maintain a consistent experience between vSAN and these external storage providers. So here, if I select my OS workload, I see that the policy-based management informs me that that's best to fit for my workload data store. But if I select the SQL data uh, policy, it gets placed on the NFS data store. And, and just like that, of course, we get a virtual machine deployed. But of course, this storage could have been somewhere else. Maybe we previously mounted this to another SDDC and there's some other data on here that we want to have access to. We, because we have the ability to attach an NFS mount to multiple different environments, maybe we use this to move some data. So we're going to come in and using the standard file system browser through the H5 client, we can register you know, any number of virtual machines. That's standard vSphere. Anything that you're used to doing from a vSphere administration perspective is mostly available inside the VMC service. We could do more than just create workloads, of course. We could run workload. It'd be kind of pointless if we couldn't. Uh, we'll go ahead and power on these virtual machines. But of course, you know, in, in, in that disaster recovery use case, 
we largely envisioned that, that one of the very first things that you're going to want to do is suck some of those VMs back onto vSAN uh, to at least uh, be able to re balance those resources. So, of course, we get full data mobility between these two environments because we've got the hypervisor. Uh, it's just standard vSphere virtualization. We can do storage vMotions in between. And at every step of the way, you'll notice that I'm always using policy-based management because it is fully integrated in every single one of these workflows, regardless of what the condition uh, is. So in this instance, we'll go ahead and pick that workload data store and kick off this storage vMotion. Uh, and we see that it takes about five minutes real time, but, but we just oops, suck that virtual machine over that NFS mount uh, and put it back up into the cloud resources. So what else could we do? Well, let's say that I got into work a little bit early and I was trying to configure multi-writer, but I read a bad blog that said I had to remove the VM from inventory. Uh, so I'm going to come in and I'll just power this off. I'm going to get it done before anybody gets to work. Um, but, I, you know, I, I do something stupid here and I, I decide to do this before I have coffee and I make what I like to call a resume generating event. Uh, as a result, when I go into the file system browser, I discover that that VM is not there. But fortunately, because this is NFS, it turns out NetApp has this ability to show a, a snapshot infrastructure through a dot snapshot folder. I can go in through that dot snapshot, find that very same virtual machine, which I just so stupidly removed, uh, and using the simple H5 interface, I can just say, hey, I'd like to copy this out to the top level file system. Now, of course, if I was using uh, NetApp private storage, I should probably want to log into the console and do a sysclone just so that I didn't have to move the data over the wire. But Incredibly powerful, right? J just by being able to attach this, this protocol uh, into a VMC environment, all of a sudden we've enabled customers to do out-of-band data protection, uh, something that the service was never designed to do in this use case. It's just an extension of being based in vSphere. Finally, uh, of course, beyond just, just a running workload, uh, one of the use cases that we did talk about was performance. So I guess we should do something with this use case. Here we've got a, a, a simple SQL Server 2016 workload. We've gone ahead and pre-installed uh, TPCC just to, just to run some workload. We're not trying to set any records here. We're not trying to wow anybody. Um, but, but we'd like to generate some real traffic using a real application just to show what you could expect. Right. Over direct connect. Yeah, over, over a direct connect interface. So here we're just going to set up a 40 user run. Uh, the, the, this particular SQL server has 20 uh, CPUs, so it's a standard 2 to 1 over subscription ratio. And we're going to run a 35 minute hammer. So we create our, our virtual users and then we'll just kick off the run. Uh, and a couple of things that we're going to note. Right off the bat, you know, we get a, a sweet <coughs> million TPM. That's great. But the thing that really catches my eye is, is, is the right traffic because this is a right workload. Right, we're writing right at 200 megabits per second consistently for the duration of this write traffic and, and, and the latency. Again, this is running in the U.S. Northeast region, never gets above two milliseconds. So this is, in this instance, in the U.S. East region, we're getting data center level performance in a cloud adjacent scenario. So that's a write workload. How about something that looks a little, little more reedy? Uh, so, so let's go into our other virtual machine that we have here, uh, our client VM. Here we have a more standard VD bench config. Uh, we've got VD bench configured with four VMDKs. Uh, each VMDK has multiple file system workers in there. Uh, and if you're interested, there is the definition if you'd like to go in and sharpshoot our test later on. But we're just going to go ahead and, and, and spin this up um, and, and get, get some work going. And again, we'll go back up and take a look at the data store level. Again, this time this is a mostly read workload. This time we're driving close to 330, 300. 50 megabits per second for the duration of the run. Uh, our read latencies are great, two milliseconds. But notice how those write latencies are getting a little high. That's because in this instance, we were attached to a NetApp private storage controller and we were actually approaching the limits of the underlying aggregate. It was so busy reading and, and servicing the workload that the light write traffic we were trickling in was actually managing to get some latency. Uh, I just point that out because over that direct connect connection, we're able to drive that, that what was it, an A200? Yeah. Yeah, drive an A200 almost to the knee uh, in, in that cloud adjacent scenario. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, from a vSphere perspective, Really what we're doing here is, is we're, we're providing a way to, to attach an NFS mount to one of these VMC environments. And, and the reason, just because we didn't touch on this, but I'll, I'll just get it out real quick. The reason we can't just give you permission to mount a data store is because there's one of the side effects of running inside Amazon's cloud is Amazon has failures all the time. And, and part of the VMware Cloud and AWS service is VMware operations handling those failures, Tran just, just seamlessly identifying a host that is on the way south 
and getting a new one in there in time so that we can maintain this cluster in a healthy state. With, we have hosts that are coming and going on a fairly regular basis. So in that system, we can't have a virtualization administrator directly managing a vSphere host. We need our cloud orchestration platform to be aware of these storage assets so that as we're bringing hosts into and out of the cluster, we can manage this mount point in addition to it. But as you can see, once we supply the mount point, at that point, it's just vSphere. And everything you know how to do, you can do, mm -hmm. with one exception. We do not allow customers to install VIBs or plugins or plugins in VMware Cloud on AWS. <laughs> so that is the only limitation uh, that, that you can anticipate, and there's no plans to lift that yet. We're still trying to push. Yeah, no, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, we're, we're, it's, it's a cloud world. We're, we're API-based. Uh, just like our backup yep. partners have to use VADP, right? We don't let VIBs there either. Um, it's, just, it's, mm. it's a reality of running all over the world at, at cloud scale. We can't have snowflakes. Okay. Yep. Very good. <laughs> How, right. how do you guys finish the support for your storage services? Because you rely on the vSync components, right? Yeah, great question. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's twofold. So this is one of the questions that we get sometimes from customers, particularly with this presentation, is, OK, fantastic. So does this mean I don't have to buy vSAN? No, that's not what this means. Uh, we still have the same hosts that we have. When you buy a host from us, it's going to come with, with the same vSAN storage capacity that we have today. Uh, and and that's, that's the primary use case for, for the service. But, uh, and, and by the way, one of the reasons that that is true is because the, the management infrastructure, that virtual center server that we were logged into there, that's running on the cluster. We don't maintain some central you know, administration cluster that all of our customers connect into. We, 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 we embed the management on the same pod itself. So we need to use an underlying storage platform that can handle the fact that these nodes are coming and going and handle transient failure. And, and vSAN and its shared nothing object store is the perfect fit for those use cases. So in this scenario, we're isolated. vSAN's protecting the management workload and, and the vSphere cluster and VMware Operations stores everything that they need to manage there. The external data storage, that's the customer. So if something happens there, however they do that, right? A resource that they own, an appliance that fails, a relationship with a third party vendor, uh, however they do that, they're handling that separate, but it would not impact the availability of the SDDC cluster, just the virtual machines that were on it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Gonna not quite Things in, a, things in AWS fail all the time. Yes. What's that mean for VM availability? Great question. In so VMware on AWS, because if the hosts are dying underneath yeah. it. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, so, so let's talk about that. Uh, Amazon is comprised, you, know, you, you all know this, but for the case of, of everyone watching at home, uh, Amazon is, of course, comprised of geographic regions. A region serves a part of the world. Inside those regions, they maintain what are known as availability zones. These are redundant islands of infrastructure that, that are intended to fail as a unit or, or block failure propagation. When we deploy a standard cluster inside the VMware Cloud and AWS service, we deploy it inside a single availability zone. Now, AZs from Amazon, of course, carry a 99.9% .9 availability with a 6.9's durability. So, so it's, it's a service that's designed to temporarily fail from time to time, but not lose any infrastructure. So a standard uh, SDDC inside VMware Cloud and AWS, of course, we're based on the, a the AZ. We, we inherit their availability. That is a problem for some customers who are taking a certain class of workload into VMware Cloud and AWS. So what we did is we integrated vSAN stretch clustering and we built onto the service what we call stretch clusters. And this enables to take a single uh, vSphere cluster and stretch it across two physical availability zones with a managed witness and a third availability zone. Now we've got a single vSphere cluster that logically spans three AZs inside a single region, and we're able to go ahead and, and withstand entire AZ level failures as a, sing, as a standard vSphere level HA event. But, but honestly, that, these are worst case scenarios because our standard availability model is based on the fact that we have an active husbandry hand in these SDDCs. Yeah, we are a team I member. That, I, I wasn't yeah. referring to storage availability in vSAN because that's resilient across multiple hosts. To my mm -hmm. VMs but and guests. AWS shoots a host in the head every once in a yep. while. Yeah. And all the VMs on that host go down. vSphere restarts it. AJ, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, way, the way that failure works inside VMware Cloud and AWS service, uh, we have a service that we call auto remediation. It, it, support in VMC is largely developers, not humans watching the thing. It's developing software that watches the thing. Uh, auto remediation services constantly monitors the VMC fleet and looks at the health of all the vSphere hosts that, that are deployed. Whenever we find a problem on any host, and, and I mean any problem, it could be a memory dim that failed. It could be we're getting DDH errors from one of the, the NVMe modules on a host. Maybe the host PSODs on us and we just lose it instantly and everything's hard down. <coughs> Anywhere in that spectrum, whenever we encounter any kind of thing that looks like failure, we instantly leverage the elasticity of Amazon's cloud and we scale the cluster up. We add a node. We just add a node and, and, and get extra capacity. The second the node's in there, which takes somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes, depending on how responsive the fleet is at that particular point in time, we then will take the problematic node and put it into maintenance mode with a full data evacuation. vSAM will then evacuate any component objects that it can and rebuild any that it can't. Th thus bringing it in. And this enables us to run clusters at capacity. So, so, so VMware Cloud and AWS clusters do not have a maintenance mode. They do not have a spare host because our operation systems add those nodes dynamically as we need to on the fly when they're required. You run the cluster for exactly how much capacity you need and no more. So those 80% rules don't apply at that point? Not at that point. No, the, the only rule that we do have is around vSAN. Uh, if, if, if we get to a 70% capacity consumption point in vSAN, uh, our, our, our operations teams will preemptively scale the cluster up and add a node just for stability. We need mm -hmm. capacity to be able to handle raw failure in a shared nothing object store. So once we get to 70% full, we need more capacity. But that's the only point where we force scale on a customer. And, and with our elastic DRS functionality, we, we'll actually dynamically scale the cluster both directions, right? We'll, we'll increase it as we need to using DRS and DPM, and then we'll scale it down as we need to as, as the, the resource load decreases. So you know, all of the options are available from that, from that perspective because, again, it's cloud compute. And, and just to get out in front of this one, too, it, the cloud is not where you go to save money. The cloud is where you go when you have to solve problems and you have to solve them now. You're buying an outcome. And, and that's really what VMware Cloud and AWS enables you to do. <laughs> Buy an outcome, a production-ready <coughs> enterprise class vSphere deployment. 